Hi. I think uh, we're live. Uh, thank you for doing this, uh, Parul, uh, on a on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I know a lot of learned and experienced investors have talked about their investing journey and their decision making and what goes into the entire process of you know selecting an uh, an investment, the valuations, etc. But we are here to discuss something you know somewhat that is very overlooked, uh, yet perhaps a very important aspect of investing in startups when we discuss uh, investments in startups, right? The regulatory aspect and the taxation aspect of it. So just to get the ball rolling, Parul, uh, I want to start with a very basic uh, question for you. Uh, why should tax planning uh, or the regulatory aspects also be an important factor in let's say the decision matrix uh, of an investor, why is it an important uh, factor that they should all, uh, you know, uh, think about before deciding to invest in a company? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Prakar, uh, and uh, uh, thanks, uh, you know, for Knowledge Capital for uh, you know getting me here. I think it's really exciting to be, uh, you know, talking and sharing views, uh, you know, on this subject and for attending the other sessions as well. So uh, I think, Prakar, your question, why is tax planning and regulatory uh, regulatory considerations, why are they extremely important? I think it's, the answer is very simple. Regulatory considerations are important because um, it decides what you can do, what you cannot do, uh, yeah. where you can invest, where you cannot invest. Regulatory considerations depend a lot on uh, you know, who you are, what your personal fact pattern is. For example, are you a resident Indian? Are you a non-resident Indian? Uh, what is your source of income from where you're investing? Uh, India is not fully convertible today on the capital account. And what that yeah. means is that uh, if you are a domestic investor, if you are an Indian resident investor, you can pretty much invest wherever you want to invest. There are no issues at all. Of course, if you invest through certain funds, then the restrictions apply to the funds, which an investor needs to know. Uh, and we'll yeah. talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but if you're a non-resident investor, then again, it's really important, you know, on how you invest in India. Uh, I get asked a lot of questions with respect to, you know, uh, how difficult is it to invest? Is it going to be easy to take the uh, money out once the returns come in? Or do you really have to do a lot of form filing uh, and so on and so forth? Taxes, of course, are important. Right. Um, what is important about tax is, you know, now uh, if someone is investing uh, in a startup in India, uh, you know, and if you are getting any returns, uh, you know, from an investment, um, there is no exemption from tax as such. But however, what is important is that if um, there is, a, you know, there is a person who is also a resident of another country, we see a lot of NRI investments also coming into India. Yeah. Uh, right then it should not be that you end up paying tax in two jurisdictions. And is there right. a way to deal with that? How do you really avoid paying tax? No one wants to, you know, evade or avoid paying tax. But I think the right. relevant question is that it should not be that you get stuck in a structure whereby you're right. not able to get a credit for taxes paid in India or you end up paying taxes in two countries. And that's the reason right. why tax and regulatory aspects are extremely important in the manner in which an investment is being done. Otherwise, it's it's you know it's actually a very fairly simple process to invest in India. Got it. No, that's very helpful. And I just want to make a shout out to the listeners who might be over here. Please, uh, there are some questions that are coming in already. Please keep the questions coming in. We uh, will try and take them as we are discussing certain aspects uh, of uh, the taxation and the regulatory aspects of investing. We will try and take these all these questions uh, when we are discussing the appropriate topic. Uh, so just on my next question, right? Uh, Parul, there are multiple entities through which investors can choose to invest. Uh, they can be investing in the individual names, in the names of the family members, and the you know through LLPs, through private limiteds. Some family offices also have trusts that are set up, uh, you know, specifically for the for asset management and investing. Uh, so should investors have a preference uh, for investing through any of the entities and can investors invest through any of these entities uh, in India and what are some of the let's say things that they should be mindful of while choosing to invest right uh, that's a good question Prakar. I think um, 
you know, this again has a mix of tax and regulatory angle also. Uh, yeah. I always think whatever structure one goes with, if you're an individual angel investor, keep it simple. Don't, yeah. you know, don't get caught in a web of entities investing through LLPs, investing through companies. Uh, they don't really help in reducing any tax. Uh, an yeah. LLP structure or a trust structure is a one level tax structure. So therefore what right. happens is someone is investing through an LLP, the LLP yeah. will pay the tax. And then the individual right. gets the uh, you know uh, gets the tax uh, on a tax free basis. The right. only difference being is on the surcharge, and right. uh, the surcharge you know if an LLP is investing into an Indian company, and if these yeah. are this is capital gain income from unlisted investments, then the surcharge right. rate uh, you know can take the tax rate to as high as forty two percent if the income okay. exceeds five crores. Um, right. And so this surcharge does not apply to an LLP, but it applies to investments made in an individual name. I think that is a slight difference that comes in, but along right. with it also comes in a regulatory hassle of maintaining an LLP. Uh, yeah. Currently, you know, the way the whole LLP law has evolved, LLPs yeah. are actually not meant for uh, investing using, uh, you know, investments. And right. uh, if one sets up an LLP and goes to a registrar for um, obtaining any sort of a registration as an LLP, the registrar yeah. is going to come back and say that, you know, you need to get a clearance from uh, uh, from RBI uh, because you are um, uh, you are actually, uh, you know, uh, using this as an investment entity. So some people right. have gone around it by trying to put some small business also within the LLP and then getting a registration. But if you do a lot of investments through one LLP, then there yeah. is a, you know, there is a chance that uh, SEBI may also come and say that, you know, this is more like an investment vehicle, especially if, uh, you know, there are three or four people pulling in together. Uh, right. Very common structure that we have seen is that there are, you know, a bunch of people, they pool in capital into an LLP and then the LLP yeah. is used for investment in different companies. Um, right. It's just it's easy for them because they're able to pool in capital and there's only one entity that goes on the cap table. They're able to share right. their uh, you know funding okay. together and then invest accordingly. But right. uh, from a SEBI perspective, this could actually be regarded as a pooled investment vehicle and there could right. be some sort of a risk there. So I won't say it's it's not permitted at all, but one needs to be really careful on how one uses uh, these type of structures. Right. Uh, Got it. Yeah. Trust structure, and, I think I've seen, Prakar. So trust structure, yeah. individually, some people have tried to use a trust structure for, you know, uh, some succession planning purposes and estate planning purposes when they'll have their family members as beneficiaries. Purely right. from an Indian tax perspective, it doesn't matter whether you're using a trust structure or you're investing uh, individually. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Got it. And let's say, uh, you know, the, the aspect of pooling in an LLP structure is managed wherein they're, they're genuinely, let's say, running uh, a business on the side and they're making a few investments. Can the advantage of in an LLP, one of the advantages that ends up happening is, and this is a question that Pranay has asked as well, where you get to set off expenses. Typically, you don't really get that liberty in your individual books. If I'm investing as Prakhar Agarwal into a company, versus I'm investing through, let's say, an LLP, I typically am able to expense my expenses that I'm incurring in the LLP to set off against the gains. Is that one of the advantages that investors can think of? Or is that also uh, not that huge of an advantage? So any distribution now, you know, we are talking about an LLP, which is an investment company uh, right. or an investment entity. So as to say, right. any distribution that comes right. from an LLP, a profit yeah. distribution is exempt yeah. in the hands of the partners. Yeah, Once right. it is exempt in the hands of the partners, then there is no question of setting off anything. The question right. is with respect to a remuneration, which one may get from an LLP. A remuneration yeah. that someone gets from an LLP is uh, treated as business income. And then one can utilize that to set off against loss of any other business and accordingly bring down your overall tax rate. But what sort of a remuneration a person can get from an LLP, which has just done a one-time, uh, you know, investment, uh, or if you are getting a remuneration for managing an LLP, 
does this bring it closer to a you know a pooled vehicle which is a managed vehicle for making investments uh, that really depends on facts of the case technically it's possible to get a remuneration but uh, how does it look like from an overall perspective that's that would be a question mark uh, india has become very very focused on substance over form so yeah. whatever needs to be done needs to be done with a commercial rationale uh, you know again like i gave the example of two or three people who have pooled in money and they are yeah. using an llp for investment purposes if one right. of the persons gets some remuneration for the purposes of management of uh, that entity and again you know where does that money really come from because all the money is already invested into companies uh, you know downstream uh that that type of a structure may be possible but again you know you have to get out of this pooled investment vehicle so that it doesn't need an ai registration got it got it and should individual investors there are multiple vehicles ways of investing in startups right i could invest in a startup directly if i have access to let's say the company i know the founders uh, they come to me directly asking me for money there's an option for me to invest directly to a company there is also an option to invest through angel funds right something like what any uh, what angelist is uh, operating under uh, in india we are operating as an angel fund in india and then there are the plain vanilla venture capital funds that invest in companies uh, sh- which type of entity do you think works best for which kind of investor uh, and should investors typically have a preference uh, for any of these different structures through which they can invest right so um, i think one of the biggest advantages of an angel fund type of a structure is yeah. that uh, you know you don't really have to manage the investment yourself Yeah. you are just uh, you know it's uh, and maybe you get access to better deals so right. pure from and maybe prakar you know you can talk about you know better than you know about uh, you know yeah. those type of non tax and non regulatory benefits i'll let you talk about that i won't really jump on that yeah. but purely from a tax and a regulatory perspective if one is investing into a company directly or if one is investing through an angel fund the taxation doesn't change Right. the angel fund taxation is um, you know it's a, it's a pass through taxation even the losses can be passed through so right. uh, so therefore if an investor is investing into a startup or an investor is investing into an angel fund uh, from a tax perspective nothing changes yeah regulatory wise uh, right. you know they could it depends again on the status um, if the angel fund is uh, foreign owned and controlled then there's a restriction on the type of deals that one can invest in yeah. but right. as a domestic indian resident investor i can probably invest in those deals uh, you know without anybody um right. but there is one big difference uh, you know for a person who's investing into a startup and a person who's investing through an angel fund the yeah. difference is that uh, you know if one wants to exit from the startup yeah. let's yeah. say that you know if i'm holding shares of company a and i right. prakar i want to sell these shares to you i will just sign right. of course subject to you know what our um, sha says and all those things right. but i can just uh, sell the shares to you and you'll pay me the you know you'll pay me for the shares and that's it we are done i'll report Absolutely. the income as capital gain you'll you'll uh, you know carry forward the cost uh, you know basis what you have paid it gets slightly tough in an angel fund or even a venture capital fund construct because one doesn't transfer the shares in the company one transfers the units that you're holding and the right. acquirer so if i'm holding shares in a fund and prakar i transfer those units to you right. you will i will still have to pay tax but you will not be able to get a step up right so there is a sort of a double taxation that happens you know because right. the fund invests the capital gains gets taxed on a pass through basis basis the original investment that was made but i would have paid the capital gains tax uh, you know separately uh, basis right. what you have paid me so there is this level of uh, double taxation that ends up happening uh, uh, you know in an uh, um, in an angel fund uh, or a venture capital fund this is not specific to an angel fund this is you know any aif that one is investing in and of course regulatory wise uh, you need to put in a minimum capital uh, for an, uh, for a category 1 aif it's 1 crore uh for an angel fund it's 25 lakhs um, 
uh, although the benefit is that in an angel fund it's a deal by deal structure so if right. it's a deal by deal structure uh, then um, at least uh, you know you can participate in all the deals that you wish to as compared to a you know a non angel fund where you don't get the right to participate but it's a kind of a blind pool structure Yeah. Right, but Akhar, I think I would love to hear from you. You know, all this is good from tax regulatory perspective, yeah. but how would you know this really work purely commercial perspective? And how would an angel investor look at investing directly as compared to investing through an angel fund? Absolutely. So I think it really depends on where in the cycle of angel investing are you right? Whether what is the kind of access that you have in the ecosystem? How comfortable are you in terms of your decision making uh whether you feel comfortable in evaluating startups what is the kind of how much time have you spent angel investing etc there are obviously some advantages to both the structures right like you spoke about there is a lot of flexibility when you invest in a company directly uh the investment amount is yours the decision to exit is solely yours whenever there is an exit on the table and typically there are no costs involved to both investing in a company and at the time of exiting a company as well unless there is an investment banker involved or anything on those lines right so typically just from a commercial commercial standpoint it might just you know investing directly into a company might just have a slight edge in case you are not the most well connected investor in the ecosystem now but this gets entirely flipped if you are not let's say the most savvy investor or you don't really have the best access in the ecosystem right because these startup investing is all investing in the private markets so there is a lot of information arbitrage there is a lot of nuance around understanding which companies are venture investable which ones are not uh, and no one can claim to be an expert uh but at the same time uh what investing through angel funds or even a venture capital fund does is that typically for an investor who is starting out on the journey right it does improve let's say the access to the kind of deals that they get so typically you know in your when you're investing in uh, startups directly you're typically limited by your own network and the people that you know and your own peers uh, whereas when you get when you're investing when you sign up to a platform like angelist and there are others as well uh, you basically get access to some of the best deals that are happening across the country and you can you know sort of learn the ropes of angel investing by seeing how the most experienced people who have been doing it for so long how they exercise their judgment most of the investors share the thesis notes the thinking around the space why are they investing in a particular company how were the commercial what are the commercials of the round in terms of valuation what are the investor rights etc that everyone's getting and this really helps a lot of investors in learning the ropes of angel investing so i would say there are advantages to both but yes like you mentioned there are also a few disadvantages to investing through angel funds which obviously where the decision may, uh, of let's say an exit needs to be either made by the lead investor who has led the investment or it needs to be a consensus of everyone who has invested through the angel fund uh, so those kind of things could be a little limiting but i think it gets offset uh, by the kind of investments uh, that an investor starts getting access to and on the flip side if you are a lead investor then obviously i would always recommend good lead investors who have access to good deal flows to rather than you know continue to invest uh, to investing directly to you know consider investing through fund structures and angel fund structures because it helps them let's say uh, commercialize their own access and be able to get some more skin in the game through earning carry and set up fees and stuff like that right so there is some aspect to for the experienced angels uh, to be able to you know uh, better the deal flow to be able to you know write larger checks to pool their own network of investors uh, Uh, into a single vehicle, uh, which could help them in you know getting access to better deals themselves and sharing it uh, you know with people uh, through the angel fund. So those are some of the advantages uh, for a lead investor from an angel fund perspective. Right, and I think in one of the deals uh, you know where I was part of, I'd also seen a lot of issues because 
uh, you know, there were about like 30 individual investors on the cap table. And to clean yeah. them up was such a big issue. And uh, at least, you know, uh, I'm glad that at least SEBI has come forth with a structure whereby people can come together in a very formalized way and regulated way and invest together. Yeah, right, right. Uh, some interesting questions. I think we can take a few of them before we go into our uh you know uh, line of discussion uh an interesting question from akshay and i know we've been discussing this as well so interesting fact is that parul and i work closely together uh parul is our tax advisor at angelus she was the one who helped us helped us set up angelus in india and the structure that we came up with this is back in 2017 when you know uh angel funds let's say per, weren't really the most mainstream structure uh so it was still a lot of figuring out of what we can do in india from an angel uh, fund standpoint so akshay ha has a question Right. What are the ways to book the capital loss when a startup goes dead, even if the company has not officially shut down? Uh, because that may take too long. And this is one of the issues that we have been tackling at AngelList as well. And obviously, there is a workaround for it. But uh, uh, I will let Parul uh, answer that. Yeah. Again, this is a very regular question that gets asked of us. Uh, you know, what do you really do when the startup goes dead as an angel investor? And right. uh, at the time, the startup is, you know, if it's going to go into liquidation, it's just going to take too much of time or you have to wait forever for it to be acquired at a de minimis price or something or the other to happen. In this case, what the best thing to do is to, you know, to request the promoters to do a buyout of the shares at, let's say, a rupee or even yeah. for the company to do a buyback of the shares. Sometimes for the company, it may not be possible to do a buyback because if it's dead, it may not have, you know, you need accounting reserves. You Even right. if, you know, there is slight bit of cash, but you need accounting reserves. But the best way to do this is to really actually, you know, request the promoters to buy out your shares at, you know, at a rupee. And uh, right. then you claim the entire loss. Uh, that's really the best way. Yeah, so this is the approach that we've been following as well for some of our companies that have not worked out where we have and once you're sure that the company has not worked out and there's no really not any value to be made for the investors, we have asked the founders themselves to acquire our shares and typically if you have a good relationship with the founder, right, most of the founders would be happy to do this because they also understand uh that the investors want to claim the losses or set off the losses against any of the potential gains that they have so they are more than happy to cooperate uh in most times uh one of the aspects that a lot of investors had uh, written in prior uh to the session as well and i want to discuss that and you know there are some questions coming in as well is cross-border investing right so one is uh, and we can pick them up uh, by turn. One is for Indian angel investors that want to invest abroad. What are, let's say, some of the norms that they should be mindful of? And secondly, obviously, the taxation aspect, which is the more important aspect. So let's say if me as an Indian investor, I want to invest into a company which is, let's say, Delaware-based or Singapore-based, which is which are the two predominant, uh, you know, geographies where Indian companies end up, uh, you know, incorporating. So, what are some of the things that I should be mindful of? And then we'll go to the second part later, which is how can NRIs also invest in India, and what are some of the, you know, uh, norms and taxation points that they should be mindful of while investing in India. Sure. So the first one, uh, you know, I'll break up the first one in two parts. Yes. How uh, yeah. an individual uh, Indian resident, an angel investor can invest outside India in startups. Yeah. And the second part to the same question is going to be if someone's already invested in a startup and the startup has flipped abroad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because that's something at least what we're seeing happening quite often, almost, you know, right. every startup is thinking of uh, flipping abroad. And there are right. some, um, uh, you know, nuances that come into play, uh, you know, there. Uh, so on the first part, which is a much easier question, how does an angel investor invest outside India? From a regulatory perspective uh, and an exchange control perspective, of course, the answer is quite clear. There is an LRS uh, route, which is um, uh, permitted by the Reserve Bank of India. LRS right. group permits uh, a domestic uh, Indian residents, uh, individuals, to invest right. up to $250,000 uh, in a financial year. 
you can right. actually club family limits through a joint holding and uh, that could also mean you know i mean if if you have a spouse if you club along with the spouse and that's 500000 dollars or you know uh, and if you do it individually if you're a family of four then that could even mean a million dollars a year which can go out right. so um as such uh, this is the most popular route for investment uh, a few uh, you know uh, guidance points here of course if it's an angel investment then one would presume that there is no control and management right and uh, you know you'll be holding less than uh, 5% in the company uh, because yeah. there is another uh, route called the overseas direct investment or the odi route under uh, indian regulatory framework whereby indians can actually set up a company abroad or they yeah. can hold majority stake or substantial stake in a foreign entity and act as a jv partner right that is permitted only in operating companies so if uh, an uh, an angel investor and an indian investor is holding interest into uh, a delaware entity which itself is an operating company then that's permitted but if it's the delaware entity is not an operating company which you know it's holding other entities um, or it's a fund then the only way to invest is through the lrs route uh, for the 250000 dollars the non odi lrs uh, route for portfolio investments Right. for people who have spent time outside india in the past and they have income which is earned from abroad uh from foreign sources and you know maintained in a foreign uh, bank account then right. that can be utilized uh, that's completely out of the indian exchange control framework and there are no restrictions at all in utilizing income which has been earned while a person is outside india for investment right. outside india from a tax perspective um the moment you get any income from that entity if it is dividend then you pay tax as dividend income if it is capital gain then you pay tax as capital gain income and of course being a resident indian you need yeah. to disclose your holding in the foreign entity in your income tax return so that's right. really important and sometimes we've seen you know some people have this concern that if we disclose uh, income in our income tax return then you know does that trade is raise any eyebrows don't not necessarily because it's a very common route for making investments outside india through the portfolio lrs route so that shouldn't really be a problem so uh, i think that's the first part to prakar i mean in case if yeah. you have any other questions on this otherwise i can talk about the fraud right. and uh, does the do the disclosures have to be made if i make an investment in a foreign fund as well or does it only have to be made when i'm investing directly into a company it is for everything it's for a foreign fund it's for a foreign partnership it's for a foreign entity even if you're a beneficiary to a trust if you're a settler to a trust if you're a trustee any right. foreign holdings need to be disclosed in the income tax return got it got it that's helpful and now uh, and also one more aspect is do these uh, do these returns when we exit a company do they get taxed twice so what that means is that me as an investor i'm investing into let's say a delaware entity or a singapore entity uh do does when the exit happens it, am i paying taxes both in the us and in india how does that work so you know um, and of course i am an indian tax expert so can't yeah see, you know say with certainty this is how us and singapore taxes the income but based right. on our experience on multiple transactions what we understand yeah. is that uh, us does not tax non residents on capital gain income and yeah. singapore also does not tax right. so therefore if an indian resident is earning any income from uh, from a delaware fund or a singapore fund then right. the person does not have to pay any tax in the us the person has to pay taxes in india right That's but if you are a our... dual citizen then there could be a slight bit of a problem because right. we've seen a lot of cases where angel investors are us citizens and they are residing in india their you know their residential status is slightly complicated uh, right. us taxes uh, people on the basis of citizenship so even if you are living in india after having taken us citizenship uh you may have to you may end up paying taxes in both the countries and then the question comes in as to which country is going to give a tax credit got it and i think one of the uh, attendees has a question that is slightly related to this so i'll take it up right now if you sell an investment amit has asked if you sell an investment in a foreign company and you get some returns uh 
are we compulsively required to bring that income back to India uh, or can we keep those funds abroad uh, because this is from income that is uh, that is generated on an investment that we made abroad? Right. So if investment is made under the LRS route for portfolio investment, then there is yeah. specific guidance that you don't have to bring the money back in India. You can keep it outside for further right. investment. And nice. while RBI FAQs are not very clear, but we have taken uh, you know a view that uh, if you use that money for further uh, investment, then that doesn't count within your two hundred and fifty thousand dollar limit. Got it. Got it. And you uh, you do have an option of uh, of keeping that money outside. You don't have to compulsory. That's right. That's right. No. You still have to pay tax on it. Obviously. Yes, right. you still have to pay tax on it, but at least you can keep the money outside, and uh, you know you can um, uh, you know you can just utilize it for other investments. Got it. Uh, and now coming to the other the the B part of it, right? For NRIs that are investing in India, uh, what are some of the things that they should be mindful of? Yeah, I think maybe we can also talk about the flip part first. Uh, yes, the flip part. yes, the flip yeah. part. Yes, the flip part. Yes, that the is. Analyze. Yeah. The chairs oh. question as well. Yeah, yeah for, best, for entities that flip uh, to Delaware or Singapore after they have raised some funding in India already. Right. So flipping is becoming extremely common, and uh, uh, you know uh, it needs to be done at the right time in order to uh, you know avoid uh, paying any. Um, Double tax in India, or paying tax in India at the time when uh, you know the income has not really you know there's no liquidity as such. Right. What so when we look at Indian law, Indian law says that if you are going to swap any securities, so if you give yeah, up yeah. shares of an Indian company and you get shares of a foreign company, there's a tax, uh, right. even if there is no liquidity. So if a company, an Indian company, is flipping outside, flipping basically means that you know, let's say there is a Singapore or a Delaware holding company set up. Singapore or Delaware holding company drops down an entity, uh, you know, to which a slum sale happens, or it just acquires this entity. And exchange for acquisition of the shares, Indian residents are issued shares in the foreign entity. Firstly, the swap is not permitted under uh, exchange control law, so you need specific RB approval. Which is given on a case by case basis. Even right. if one were to get an RB approval, the there is a tax basis. What you give up and what you get. Uh, right. So right. it's actually so if you put in ten dollars to acquire the shares and the value of the shares that you're getting, the fair value today is hundred. Even though there is no liquidity event, you still have to pay tax on ninety dollars. Right. So the way that this is done, uh, you know, again, very fact specific. Each case has to be dealt with uh, separately. Uh, sometimes when the value is uh, is very low, uh, you set up the foreign entity with the initial investors at a low, uh, you know, uh, at a low price, and then the foreign investor comes in at a premium such that the shareholding is maintained. So you still have the same, uh, you know, percentage shareholding in the foreign entity. Um, at times, uh, you know, and this is more for promoters. Promoters are given employee stock options uh, in the foreign entity. And yeah. uh, uh, or sometimes shares of the foreign entity are uh, uh, issued to relatives, and then the relatives give the shares to Indian residents, which is permitted under exchange control regulations. But usually we don't, you know, we we don't usually recommend that because in a way you are using the exchange control regulations to get shares of a foreign entity. The right. most uh, you know uh, sought way of doing this now. Has been through a put and call option agreement. So what really happens is that, um, and this is actually fairly used in SPAC transactions also now. Uh, we yeah, recently, yeah. you know, uh, did the uh, the renew eight billion dollar SPAC transaction, and right. uh, this is this type of a structure is used widely in uh, SPAC transactions. Uh, what really happens in this case is that the Indian shareholder or the Indian angel investor. Stays invested in the Indian company. The foreign company, which is set up, acquires. You know, let's say I'm just assuming some numbers here. Acquires 95 percent of the Indian company. Five percent is left with the Indian investors. Uh, so Indian investors don't really have the direct, uh, you know, shareholding in the foreign entity. But there is a put and call option arrangement, which is entered into between the shareholders of the Indian company and the foreign entity, that. Each time there is a sale of shares of the foreign entity, 
the foreign entity will uh, you know purchase shares of the indian entity from the indian promoter and the valuation is pegged to the shares of the foreign entity so it's a it's a very simple arrangement but written in complicated terms whereby right. you know to ensure that if indian investors want to exit from the indian company their valuation is pegged to the shares of the foreign entity basis their percentage of holding and as if they would have gotten the shares in the foreign entity and uh, subsequently you know if um, uh, if there is uh, any exit that happens at the foreign entity level it is it may come in by way of an investment into the foreign company which is then utilized to purchase the shares uh, of the indian investors so that's uh, that's how uh, this really happens got it and typically when a flip is happening parul do, does the indian entity have to set up a fresh indian entity or can the existing indian entity that they are operating already can that be uh, acquired let's say by the by the new foreign entity that's being set up so because uh, um if yeah. there's a new entity that's being set up the investors will still have to let's say mirror their shareholding in the new Correct. indian entity as well right? whether it's indian or foreign right so usually if this entity already has a lot of value then yeah. a, a new indian entity is not set up because right. uh, what will happen in that case is that um, uh, you know and now earlier people were doing slum sales at book value now the there has been a change in law that you can't do slum sales also at book value you can't transfer right. out a business at book value you have to transfer out at the fair value so the same right. entity can be used but the way that the flip happens is that uh, the you know a, a shift in the shareholding usually takes place when there are also certain foreign investors and they take benefit of some tax treaty or something like that happens if there is already value which is existing in this entity then you set up a new entity try to migrate existing investors into the new entity by again issuing them shares first and that to at a low valuation and then subsequently uh, you know the foreign uh, entity money coming in at a huge premium uh, such that the shareholding percentage is maintained and you find a way to transfer out the assets if at all in the old entity to the new entity got it that's helpful and just one more question before i think there are some questions in the uh, from the audience as well which are interesting and i'd like to cover uh, but uh, quickly if we can also cover what are the aspects of nris investing into indian companies or indian funds and what should they be mindful of one on the regulation side and two on the taxation side so nris uh, you know they can invest um, under the foreign exchange control uh, regulations uh, there is a scheme of portfolio investment also for nris but okay. if they have uh, domestic accounts in india uh, their yeah. nre accounts uh, or nro accounts then that can be utilized also for investment purposes and in fact if you invest on what we call a non repatriation basis that is yeah. when you the exit you keep the money within india and you don't repatriate it then in that case uh, uh, you are actually treated at par with a domestic investor Right. so uh, nri investment is uh, is uh, pretty simple in that sense um they are also allowed to uh, repatriate about a million dollars a year from their nri account so it's not even that it's completely on a non repatriation basis um where tax is concerned again you know uh, they pay tax uh, just like any individual will uh, there is no um, you know difference in taxation of a resident individual as compared to a non resident got it got it so i mean from a from an indian tax point uh, tax fan perspective from as long as let's say investors are investing from their nro nre accounts they are pretty much at par in terms of the taxation rates uh, uh, for their investments that they're doing in india whether it's through a fund or directly correct correct yeah got it that's helpful uh, parul just now going through some questions um uh, that are there from the audience just give me a second i think there is one for uh, you know by manoj agarwal ai if is passed through in india what happens to income yeah. from investments made through telaware series uh, entity are they passed through or they are still taxed twice 
so again uh, you know yeah. where indian taxation is concerned um, aif is a tax pass through entity that's correct so when the delaware entity uh, gets income from um, uh, you know from the indian aif the delaware entity pays the tax there's a withholding that happens by the aif in the name of the delaware entity and there's a for long term there is a 10% tax that applies so the delaware fund will end up paying tax in india the for the investor in the delaware entity now that depends on of course investor does not have to pay any tax in india but however um, uh, there are us taxes that may uh, you know that may apply for uh, us investors in the delaware llp and uh, if they have to pay tax in the us uh, what i understand is that they may not be able to get a credit for the india taxes in the us so this 10% tax may be an additional tax for uh, you know investors that are coming into the delaware uh, fund if they are paying taxes in us or their home country wherever they might be coming from right. and i think that's so, that's another interesting uh, thing that happens prakar is you know when we were talking about the flip is yeah. india has what we call a vodafone tax it's yeah. an indirect transfer tax right and uh, of course it applies to non resident indians so therefore yeah. in an angel investor who is a non resident indian is holding shares in a singapore entity which is holding an indian entity and there right. is a transfer of shares that takes place of the singapore entity even though you've not sold indian shares you still have to pay tax in india because right. uh, this is um, uh, you know uh, this is uh, considered to be an indirect transfer and there is a tax requirement that has to be fulfilled by paying taxes in india so this indirect transfer uh, is again something uh, to watch out for which applies only to non resident investors not to indian investors indian investors pay tax in respect right i think manoj has a follow up where he says indian investor investing into a delaware entity which is then investing in a us company a similar model that we also follow at angel list for you know making our foreign investments uh, i think we've already covered this but i think over here uh from whatever our understanding is there should be no taxation at the delaware entity level right uh whenever the funds are distributed into our individual hands from the delaware entity then obviously we are taxed on it uh, as per an indian uh, resident but from a delaware entity perspective uh non residents are not taxed on their capital gains in the delaware entity yes that's what i understand from us law but of course you know people should get it revalidated by us tax right and one question that siddharth has is that can they invest by the lrs route uh in a partnership entity in singapore where you may hold more than 5% of that entity okay so this is a little bit of an interesting question the way it's interesting is because there are two aspects one is a partnership yeah. entity and the other is the threshold of 5% technically right. speaking uh indians are not allowed to invest in partnerships abroad and right. uh, the reason being is because uh, you know our indian law uh, at the time when these rules were framed we just had a general partnership where there's unlimited liability so i right. did not want that indians invest into partnerships abroad and they incur unlimited liability whereby this flight of capital from india but right. uh, uh, you know if it's a limited liability partnership we have seen banks being comfortable with this and we've also got an approach from rbi that if the bank allows you to make the investment then you should uh, go ahead and uh, uh, make that investment so uh, that's something to check with the bank it's a bank to bank kind of uh, you know uh, a position 5% uh, you know this 5% is linked to portfolio investment now there is no threshold as to what yeah. is portfolio investment and rbi has not defined it uh, we have seen you know investments even been made for 10% uh, i would say that if it's slightly less than 5% 6 or 7% that should also be okay as long as right. it is true portfolio investment you know you, you're not really acting uh, uh, you know uh, being taking part in any control or any management you just a true investor that's the way that i would look at and if right. your bank approves then you should go ahead and do it. right and also one of the i think qualifying conditions there is also that you should not be a part of the articles of association and stuff like that right which i think is having correct, control correct correct yeah right that's right got it uh, i think that's helpful uh, just seeing uh, we may be drawing to the limit of our time but just seeing if we can take i think we've taken most of the questions over here
Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for doing this, Parul. I think uh, Gaurav has uh, joined us over here as well. Uh, but no, I think this was very helpful. A lot of uh, questions from the audience. I think I hope we've uh, covered most of them. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Parul and Prakar. I think it was one of the most nuanced and uh, I would say very technical, which a lot of people overlook. But like the, it's something that angel investors should know. I mean, definitely making investments is one bit of it, but also understanding the implications around it, right? Uh, so thank you so much, Prakar and Parul, uh, on behalf of Investments Decoded and Knowledge Capital. Uh, you guys have been very, very, very informative for all of us. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks, Prakar. Thanks, Gaurav. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Parul. Thanks, okay. Gaurav. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Do join us for the next session. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Bye.